Hello. Today's video is part of a series of interviews I'm doing to help publicize the 2022 conference of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. The conference is known as SciCon, and it'll take place in Las Vegas from October 20th to the 23rd. Susan Gerbeck is one of the speakers scheduled for SciCon this year, and I'm happy to be able to talk with her now. Thank you, Ms. Gerbeck, or may I call you Susan? You may call me Susan. Thank you. You may, you may call me the princess princess of the universe if you want I'll call to. you I Susan. Care. During his interview last week, Neil deGrasse Tyson kept telling me to call him Neil, but I just couldn't do it. I kept saying Dr. Tyson. So I had to ask you. Um, for any viewers who don't know who Susan is, let me fill them in. Susan is a CSI fellow who's been referred to as the most important woman in skepticism. She established and runs the GSOW project, which has been called the most important project in skepticism. Beyond Wikipedia, her focus has been exposing and educating the public about psychics and grief vampires, mediums. She's the winner of CSI's 2019 Robert P. Ballas, I think that's how you say that, prize for critical thinking. And several years ago, she used a grant from the JREF to establish a nonprofit about time, focusing on scientific skepticism and activism. She doesn't have a podcast of her own, but she makes regular appearances on The Skeptic Zone, billed as the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Welcome, Susan. Hi, Rob. Okay, I'd like to start uh, talking about your appearance at this year's conference. Your, uh, your talk is interestingly titled Herding Cats with Susan Gerbeck and is described as follows. I'm going to read it. A romp through the past 24 months with guerrilla skepticism on Wikipedia and the grief vampire investigations, Operation Lemon Meringue and Operation Onion Ring. Gerbeck's mission is to keep this community active and growing with skeptic camps, interviews, and a social trivia group that has not missed a Thursday night since May 28th, 2020. Amazing. Herding cats. So am I a cat? What's this with herding cats? Oh, yes, absolutely. You're one of our cats. Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. We have so much talent in our community. We just got to find them, motivate them, mentor them, throw them back out in the world, keep mentoring them, keep motivating them. Look at you. Look at you, Rob Palmer. Uh, don't talk about me. No, no. Look at you. You are a cat. You are one of the cats that I herded. And I've got lots of cats out there that I've herded. And I think we need to find lots more cats out there. And I think Sycon yeah, is a great I will actually ask you, I'll ask you later for the, some specifics of that, of the cats. Cool. Yeah, so let's talk about GSOW first. Okay, what would you uh, like to know? I have to put on my glasses if I'm going to read a screen. I don't know if you have to do that. Maybe. Like, I got to know how many, how many, how many uh, you're going to yeah, ask. Yes, so I am going to ask you for some numbers. Okay, so, so, you know, skeptics like numbers. So I've got to have, I got to have numbers. All right. So I first heard of you on yes. an episode of the Skeptic Zone, where you were talking about this little project you had set up called the Guerrilla Skeptics on Wikipedia. And you talked about the huge impact they were having on the accuracy of the encyclopedia on mm -hmm. topics of concern to skeptics. And you mentioned that paranormal believers really hate you and the team. Mm -hmm. So a Google search verified that, and I was wondering if I should join, but I found a site promoting astrology and it, it, it was specifically vilifying you like you're some sort of a deep state you know, <laughs> manager and, and the whole group was trying to suppress the truth. And then I found a site by parapsychologists um oh what's his name none gary oh gary null gary null yes saying, saying -L -L. Thing. yeah yeah so you were ruining the wikipedia you know you we're just covering up the truth so so that was in 2016 i think and when i read all that stuff i signed up immediately well you know if they, it. if they hate you so you know that had to mean something so you missed a, you missed a whole bunch of my haters so <laughs> So of course, Brzezinski I, Clinic was one that really was after me for a yeah, while. I didn't get involved with uh, you, I guess, at that time. Of course, I didn't really expect to hear from you when I wrote. I wrote you on Facebook with a DM that said, "Dear Ms. Gerbic, can I please consider joining your team?" And I'm thinking somebody from the team is going to contact me on your name. And no, Susan invites <laughs> me to join, and she does all the training herself. It's quite amazing. I, so, I'm, is, has that changed? Do you still do all the training yourself? Yeah, unless it's a language that I don't speak. I mean. I only barely speak English and some Spanish. So if somebody was to come to our project who doesn't speak enough English that I could figure out how to, how to train them, then probably somebody else will. But we have started to train, change some of our lessons, some ex, our lessons exactly, you know, the whole thing 
and we've translated them into other languages, but using screenshots in that language. So it's like if like if we're teaching somebody in Czech, the some one of my Czech editors would go in and make screenshots of the page and then explain it. And we saw so a lot of more was just screenshots and explanations and screenshots and more explanations and so on. So um, but I still want to mentor them. I want to I want to be in contact with them, but we really haven't had enough, not even slightly enough people in languages outside of English to join, especially people who are marginal English speakers, but they're welcome. We'll, we'll figure out how to train them somehow. <laughs> all right, so how many pages altogether? I don't, I didn't catch if you said. How many pages? And, and that we've written? As, yes, how many pages? Might as well say that now. 2,092. And, and that's pages? completely written or taken a stub and rewritten it to a perfect, nice big page. We will never, ever write a stub. And how many page views have those articles received? So the 2,092 pages, because we keep track of us, you know, and we're at 118 million, million, 190, 792 page views. It, once a day, it, it uh, loads for me so I can look at this. So in the last week, we have had 350,000 views. Uh, amazing. So amazing, amazing. I mean, and, and it's not just the user. The average person going and reading the page or looking at the page it is that the media is accessing these and you know this as well as i do because you have done uh talks on this and i think an article on it how we can we see that some of the things we have written on the wikipedia page that are obviously written by a dsw editor you know it's not a like a just a generic term you could google that phrase you know put italics around it and it appears on blogs email i mean other kinds of articles in the media and one of the most our words and using them again i know one of the most interesting places was usa today sports of all places right ronda rousey right female fighter sat down with the medium tyler henry so of course that had to be big news you know and she contacted a dead relative of some sort through tyler henry supposedly and because the writer for usa today sports read his wikipedia article tyler henry's that you know we had some hand in having all the criticism he did not take it seriously yeah he made it clear he used the phrase grief vampire several times in his mm -hmm. article and other and other phrases that were on the wikipedia page made it clear that the no. where he was getting the reporter was getting his information was straight from the wikipedia page you know uh, it feels like i would like to have reporters do a better job of of doing research but you know, I'll face it, they're not. They don't have the time. They don't have the staff. They're just going to Wikipedia and pulling stuff off of there. And this is happening all over. We haven't tracked it. We just, you know, sometimes stumble across it. But I mean, if I had an editor that just wanted to sit there and figure out how many times our words are being used in, in uh, the media, it would be a full-time job, I think. So, so I, we know. Our, I also get asked, by the way, do you tell editors once you've trained them what to work on? What to work on? Yep. What articles to work on? What Not really. What I want them to work on something that they're interested in. I might suggest something and say, well, you know, since you just finished that article on that biography of a person, it's an easy jump to maybe work on their on the book they wrote or the organization or something, maybe something like that. But as far as as far as telling people what to do, no, I don't I don't think that that would go over very well in the community. But people ask me from time to time, you know, I'm kind of stumped. I don't know what to work on. I'll say, well, here's some ideas. And I keep a spreadsheet of, of badly written, you know, like stubs and things like that from people in the science community. And I'll say, you know, pick something off of here. I think I've got a couple hundred pages on there. And I'll say, well, I know you're really interested in veterinary care. You love animals. So here's, here's somebody, I have no idea who they are, but their Wikipedia page is a stub and they're a a veterinarian that or you know some sort of something involved with the world of animals and here's an idea but, so but <laughs> no, I, I don't tell anybody what to do it, it would be a waste of, waste of my time <laughs> i did see sort of a consensus develop though when the pandemic started that we right. you know as a group should start working on the articles having to do with vaccines and the anti-vax movement and conspiracy theories absolutely yeah people yeah, who are in the news who promote anti-vax stuff right right so right when the pandemic was starting it was obviously it was going to be more than a few weeks 
And then they started talking about vaccines, just like just the beginning. I said, all right, you guys, this is vaccines are going to be hot and everybody's going to need information about vaccines. And so everybody picks something related to vaccines and write about it in any language you want. And it could be pro, con, anything. We did that and we are at 109 pages. Yeah, 109 pages that are we tagged vaccine and they have 5,600,000 views. It is, it is amazing and I'm always surprised and just so proud of the team for being able to do this. It, it's like they're, I'm not a scientist. I don't have a degree in science. Of, well, social and behavioral science is my BA. I've never used it for anything, but it, these are people who are doing this because it's the right thing to do. And because I'm organizing them to do it and to set up the training and I mentor them and I talk to them, but it's not, I'm just, I'm just amazed. At how, how do people how listening who might like to get involved with this join up? We are on Facebook. So start and write out, send me a private message. I want your email. I want to know what language you want to edit in. And I want to know how you found out about us. Like, you know, this lecture, this talk that uh, Rob is doing right now. And I want to know your username. So you have to go to Wikipedia and make an account with your name you're going to edit under. And I need that. Then what I'm going to do, and, and send me a friend request too, because I can't really like put you in the secret cabal or anything unless we're friends. So send me all that and have a conversation with me. I'll be happy to just chit chat with you and answer any of your questions. But um, then I will send you a pre-training. Now, this is what we've, we've, we came up with in, I think, 2018, because we were having a lot of people who would say they wanted to join, say they wanted to, um, to uh, um, train, and then they didn't ever go anywhere. So what I do is I have made a pre-training, which is like two hours of stuff. It's really simple stuff. It's not like complicated or anything like that. And then they do that for two hours. I check over their work and then if then I have a little conversation with them and say, okay, this is going to be about two months of stuff. Are you ready to go? And they say, yes, I'm so excited. I'm looking forward to this. And then I put them in the secret cabal and then their formal training starts. And that's and they get it. To meet all the other people in the cabal from all over. And the you world. get to meet people from all over the world who are instantly your best friends because they're so excited to meet you and they're and people are very friendly and they're looking for commonalities like where are you from what are you interested in what podcast do you listen to who's your favorite football team or whatever and they're talking to each other to find commonalities and it's like you you uh become a bigger group because we're socializing so let's move on to the other major interest i know you have psychics and mediums so my perception as to what drives you is your goal to reduce the harm that holding false beliefs can have on people and society. And it seems that you're interested in, in exposing psychics and mediums fits that bill, right? Like, how did you get into that? Psychics just really hit me. And then, you know, what they were doing. And it was because I was on the James Randi Educational Foundation had a forum back before we had Facebook. And I was attending, I, I wanted to attend the amazing meeting. And I'm just sitting there at this amazing meeting for, I don't know anybody. And I'm, and I'm sitting there thinking, I want to do something. I want to, I want to do something. And when I went back to the forum, I found a man named Robert Lancaster, who was writing and researching about Sylvia Brown, the psychic medium. And so he's dead, kid. So he's, you're, dead, yeah, kid. he's dead. Kid is dead. Yes. Your kid is dead. <laughs> People look her up. B-R-O-W-N-E is her last name. And so he was asking for some help. He was looking for somebody who could who could help him with some transcripts that he was looking for from the show she was on all the time, Montelli Williams show. So I said, well, I have access to that because I'm still in college and I'll, I'll help you. And I did what I could. And doing that introduced me to the world of the, the pain and what they do, the, the psychic mediums do, um, latch onto people's griefs to make a buck. And so that was what caught me. So it wasn't anything else other than that. I just was very interested because somebody had posted, they needed some help. And I just 
put my hand up and said, I'll help. And then eventually it became kind of my thing. And then of course I met Mark Edward on a James Randi cruise. And Mark Edward is um, an expert on psychics because he wrote the book on it. He lived that life for uh, for 13 years, I believe. And, and as well as being a, psych a skeptic. Psychic blues. Conflicted. Confessions of a conflicted confessions medium. Confessions of a conflicted medium. Yeah, I interviewed so, Mark about the book, yeah. Well, yeah, he's he's a wealth of knowledge on psychics, especially the history of psychics and and the 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 things they do or to look like they're psychic and that are medium trip medium mentalism tricks. Thank you very much, Susan. I can pull that word out of my hat. No, I'm not wearing a hat. Um, mentalism tricks. So, which are basically the stuff the psychics do. So, meeting Mark kind of reinforced your interest in the subject, I guess. Yeah, that was 2009. And so we got together as a couple in a few months later and that just kind of made it, that was it. And then I got involved with the independent investigations group in LA. Which is what? for people who don't know? CFI IG now. And it used to be independent investigations group IIG. So they test claims of the paranormal, but they offer a uh, I think it's now $250,000 uh, paranormal challenge. And I did that for a while and I'm about seven hour drive from there. So I'd go down every month because that's where Mark Edward was living. And we'd go to the thing, the meetings. And it was really interesting. I met amazing people who are still friends of mine. Speaking of uh, Ross Blotcher uh, from the Ono Ross and Carey group. And I did that for a while. And finally I said, I'm done with this. I, it is for reasons that are too long to go into into this conversation. I wanted to be independent from them and I wanted to be able to do my own thing. I didn't feel like things were happening fast enough there. And so I started doing my own psychic stings. I stay, I'm in control of it. Yeah, that was my next question. Tell me about right. some of your most interesting or impactful stings. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys. So I, I started doing these stings. Now they're, they're, they're time consuming. How do I say this? We wanted to, what I found in the IIG was that they were overthinking everything. I mean, overthinking it to such an extent that they were unable to, to move beyond to actually do the sting because they thought it over for way too long so well, because they need to come to an agreement with the person claiming the paranormal abilities and both parties no. have to agree on the test right i'm talking about stings that they were attempting to do oh i, I was not aware that they right they even never happened for some reason or not ah. but they were planned and and i was involved in one that was called the medium large project and it never finished because it was dragging right. on because it was constantly a discussion anyway long story so that never happened okay. never happened and so um i just got frustrated with a lot of that kind of stuff i i'm not that type of person so, so. Who, who have you successfully stung well it, it stings actual stings i've been involved with tyler henry well no i wouldn't call that a sting you know i guess this thomas john would be the biggest one that would be considered a sting where we caught them a lot of other psychics we've looked at, we've researched, and we have, we can show the tricks they're doing. We can show the wordplay. We can explain Tyler Henry. We can explain Sylvia Brown. We can explain um, a lot of these different psychics and how they're doing it, what it looks like. We can see it. But as far as a sting, the only one we've actually done is Thomas John, because he's so easy to sting. He's it's just so obvious that he's hot reading. So Thomas John is the has had two uh, network shows, the Seatbelt Psychic and uh, Thomas John it? Experience. Right, two different networks, and in both cases he's driving around and he either talks to dead people in the back of his car with the people who got in the car, or he stops off at a random place supposedly and talks to their dead relatives. And and so you've heavily investigated him, and and one of the reports was actually published in the New York Times. New York Times Magazine, you bet. Yep, that was a big one. That was called Operation uh, Pizza Roll. But I did Operation Pizza Roll just on a whim. I put it together in like 10 days. That was crazy. And we did that, Mark Edward and I, and we attended a, a Thomas John 
a show down in Hollywood, I think, or somewhere in LA. And we had people write Facebook pages that were fake characters. And those people um, had things happening to them in their lives and they had, you know, work issues or whatever. They would post up, post things on their fake Facebook pages. But those fake Facebook pages had no connection to Mark or I. We didn't have access to them. Um, all we knew is that right before we went into the event to go see the psychic on stage is we were given a very tiny amount of information. And then we sat there. So, cause we have to know when to raise our hand because what the psychic will do is he said, and I have audio of all of this, I was wired. So, so everybody could, so we recorded everything. So he says on from the stages, I'm getting a twin who wants to be in contact with her, her brother um, a few, you know, a few years ago, something like that. And I knew to raise my hand because that's my cue. And I also knew that my twin had died of pancreatic cancer a few years ago. That's all I knew, really, I think. And Mark had a father who was, um, uh, I guess, had, had died of heart, addition, heart problems. And now that Mark is at the age where his father was when he died, Mark was having, um, you know, worried about having heart problems. And so he was starting to get tests and things like that. So that's what was posted on his Facebook page, along with a lot of other information that we weren't aware of. And then what happened is the psychic says, you know, he's obviously talking to us. He said, you know, I'm getting that the, your twin was like died of cancer or something in this area. I think it's a uh, stomach. No, it's pancreatic cancer. And I'm like, that's it. And I start to cry or pretend to cry. And then he went on to Mark and I back and forth for 15 minutes. We have it all recorded about details that we just faked. We just said, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Even though we didn't know the real answer and it was obvious that something was going on because the psychic could see that we didn't know who Steve was. I said, I think it's your, Oh, you mean your brother? And, and it was actually Mark's dad. So, and like, who's buddy? I said, Oh, that was my brother's nickname. And it turned out to be our dog. So we're just winging it there. <laughs> so, so to be clear, you, you didn't know all that you and Mark did not know all the details because you didn't want him, if he was caught, to later come back and say, oh, it came from your mind. He was reading right. your mind. Right. So it's double blinded. And that's how we did it. But anyway, so we did that sting. We caught him. It was obvious. You can read all about that in multiple articles that we've got out there on Operation Pizza Roll. But what happened is um, a New York Times writer said, I'd like to do something on you guys when you do a sting let me know when you're going to do a sting or something so we 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 did this when so we pulled it off it was so simple and we wrote to him and he says oh that's fantastic i'd really like to write about it but now i need to see it done so i put on another sting and we called it operation peach pit and we used uh, matt frazier and we called in kenny biddle and his wife donna and a few of his friends back in pennsylvania or Connecticut, I can't remember. Pennsylvania, and, and Matt, Matt Fraser uh, is of the Meet the Frasers, which happened later. Right, so he was he's still around. So the reporter was able to sit with the team I had done. Talk, we were talking over the internet like we are doing right now. And he was able to sit in those meetings and he was able to go to Kenny Biddle's house where they were talking, you know, planning. And he was able to attend the event. He sat far away from the team, but he was listening. And, and then he went afterwards to the postmortem where they, you know, we were talking about what happened. And then he was able to write an article. And that's what appeared in the New York Times magazine, Sunday edition. So it's a long format story. And it was very popular. And um, that was two different stings. So it didn't matter that we didn't catch Matt Frazier. We were able to learn a lot about what Matt Fraser does and his technique. Because he and I believe Bill wrote point. that up in an interesting article explaining uh, the cold reading and all that stuff. Right, right. Okay, so one other specific topic I want to touch on is another thing that uh, I know that you are involved with because you know it harms people: facilitated communications. So, can you oh explain gosh. what that is? You know, just quickly, and what your involvement in educating the public in it. Okay, so facilitated communication is uh, 
a technique of communication technique that started about 1980s. It got more popular in the 1990s. And it is um, started in, well, it doesn't really matter, but it came over via Australia to the United States. And it's mostly being the hub of it is in Syracuse University in New York City. They're still teaching these classes, still supporting people to do this. It's an institute over there. So facilitated communication, if you take a keyboard, is that you have a person who is severely communication, unable to communicate for, um, I'm trying to figure out how to say this gracefully, for mental They're, issues. they're kind of locked in. Locked in. These aren't people who have motor problems. Okay. They, I mean, these people, if you put a bunch of um, potato chips on a plate, they would be able to pick them up and put them in their mouth. There's not like they have a problem with their motor skills. These are people who have severe mental communication issues. Challenges. So I, I guess the yeah. thing is that the people who believe in this believe the term I used before is actually wrong. That's what they believe. They believe they're locked in. They believe they're perfectly right. as well cognitively mental. as anyone yeah. else. They just can't talk. Right. Exactly. That, that's their claim. They think it's motor issues and confidence issues and that they just need a security and to be encouraged to to do this. So these so how do we how do we know it's not that? So how okay, do we well, know? we know that it's not that because the facilitator is moving the person's hand or cueing them, and it, and sometimes it looks very smooth. I mean, you can't really tell very easily because they have long practice with with this this patient, this person, the student. So they're moving their hands. We can see it. It's the clever Hans effect. It's the idiomotor effect. It's the uh, Ouija board effect. The very slight movements cueing make them move it and, and that it, implies that the facilitator the person holding the hand doesn't really realize they're doing it is that true well the facilitator could close their eyes while they're facilitating the person and instantly know that they're not doing what they think they're doing if 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 you're holding somebody's hand or elbow or shoulder or holding on to their sleeve and the person's finger is moving on a keyboard, right? And it's typing something out. If you close, if you're the facilitator and you close your eyes, just like with a Ouija board, garbage is going to come out because the person, the person is being facilitated. And there's video after video after video of this are not looking at the keyboard. They're off looking over here and they're trying to get away. They're trying to, there's, there's, stimming I think it's called they're trying to get away they're doing things to because they're stressed they're trying to they're or they're complacently just sitting there because they know that they have to get through this before they can go on to do whatever they want where the facilitator is focused razor sharp on that keyboard and, and there's another one that's so because it's been discredited so many times what happens is they keep changing the name of the thing and they have different they have different um uh, tools they're using right now they're using uh, letter boards it's giant like eight by ten size letter board with giant letters on it and it's clear plastic a lot of times and they hold it in the air they hold a piece of paper in the air like this and the and the person they're they're um supposedly communicating with is holding their finger still and they're moving the letter board to meet the finger where so same this, thing this seems why do you need obvious. to hold it in the air nobody has explained that why is it you can see right. them moving it and then they call out the letters as the person touches them supposedly they call out the letters but you can slow down the video and look at it and they're not touching the letter that sometimes they're touching in between so this letters. seems so clear from the outside with it's these obvious how is syracuse university doing how how money Lots and lots and lots and lots of money. So when you when you are a parent of and you're desperate, you are desperate to to have your child be able to go to college to live a life. These some of these kids go to college. They've graduated. One just got her became valedictorian, and it was all over the news just this last summer. And people were like, "Oh, this is amazing!" And we're going. That's facilitated communication. It's it's. It's exactly it. And the media ate it up, a feel-good story that was just 
everybody was like, oh, and if you say anything bad about it, if you say that's facilitating communication, that woman is not communicating, then it's, then it's, you're the bad person. You're an ableist. We're, you know, it's, the emperor has no close effect, but because the student has been allowed to progress and the teachers keep um, pushing him through, pushing him through, they don't want to, they don't want to rock the boat there that it's, you know, by the time the child's in high school or college, who's going to, what professor is going to say, by the way, none of this is real. You are not authoring these words and you've never been tested. They're not allowed to test because to test is to say you're not competent. So it's, it's egregious. People think it's a feel good thing and there's a ton of money in it because the parents are I mean, after your child has been communicating with you for a few years and said, I love you, mommy, so much. And, you know, and, and I don't like that skeptic person over there who's trying to test me. I mean, mommy, don't, I don't want to do that. This is, this is stressing me out. I can't, I'm going to fail because that person's in the room, that kind of stuff. Then what happens is uh, people just go, oh, no, just, just shh, shh, shh. So, all right. So what, what have you? you've been doing to try to uh, push back on this so regarding on Wikipedia or elsewhere? First thing is to get the Wikipedia pages, all the Wikipedia pages concerning facilitated communication, rapid prompting method, the people of who, who are the supporters of this. Um, so you're all the Wikipedia Wikipedia university pages had to be I guess, is that redone. mentioned on their website, on their, uh, on their uh, um, Wikipedia article? Everything had to be done. So that took us a year or two. And uh, they're well done, they're well written, they've been vetted multiple times. People use those Wikipedia pages for all kinds of uh, information. So we knew before we started with any kind of campaign to educate the community, we had to start with um, Wikipedia. Because it's, I mean, duh. Um, if, you try to, if you try to launch a website or you try to um, um, educate the media and you don't have the Wikipedia pages in order first, it's just like, it's backwards, you, you, it's silly. So um, that was first. Then we had to start educating people in the skeptic and science community. And Janice Boynton's been doing a lot of that with her talks and explaining it in detail what it is and how to watch for it. And then we started letting putting uh, Syracuse University and other universities on, on notice that we know what they're doing and they need to stop this. And we give them examples. We give them written articles. We've had other articles written by experts in journals. Um, we've done tons of research and we're making these universities understand you are on notice because, and it's true, we're just waiting for a big story to happen because what happens with facilitated communication multiple times is somebody gets accused of sexual um, uh, abuse. The facilitator gets accused? No, the facilitator accuses a family member of sexual abuse this happens it's happened a bunch of times and if you look at the facilitated communication wikipedia page there's a bunch of case studies uh, that has happened because if a parent is starting to um, push back you know let's say there's a there's a husband and wife and the wife is all for it and the father isn't and maybe there might be a divorce or some problems in the marriage well the facilitator might start saying that the reason why daddy doesn't like this facilitated communication is because daddy's actually abusing the child. So we've had people uh, accused of this. They're in, they've had jail time. They've had their children taken away from them on and on. And nothing's ever stuck, but there's some people who've been in jail for, for considerable Yeah, just going through the legal process like that could ruin your life, regardless of whether you ever you found And then the family and people around say, well, there's smoke, there must right. be fire. So right. their reputation is ruined, right? They're, they're fired from their jobs. Their children are taken away from them. They lose the custody battles on and on and on. It's really awful. I would actually say, Susan, that your biggest contribution to the skeptical movement isn't the specific areas we talked about, but it's your ability to get people who otherwise would not be involved to get involved and become skeptical, skeptical activists themselves, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, but we, if I tell people that, then they get run scared. But what it is, yes, this is my. If I have a special skill, I am not the most. You said at the beginning, you said the most. Um, I don't know. You said something about me being the most whatever. I've seen the phrase "most powerful woman," not the most. What, I don't know. What do you say in your name? I think, yeah, somebody said the most powerful. Jay, most powerful woman. Jay recently said it at Skeptical, right? Well, it's not, it, it's kind of a joke. 
but it, it, and I don't want to be the most powerful woman. I just would like to be the most powerful person would be nice. You know, I don't want to be getting into the women thing, you know, because, you know, it's a joke. It really is a joke. You guys, it's just started out at one of the, one of the conferences. And but actually I think the quote was most important woman in skepticism. You said important. No, it is definitely not that. Cause they were holding signs up saying most powerful woman in skepticism. And it was hilarious. It was funny as heck, but if I have a superpower, it is exactly that. I am just a person who used to sit in the crowd, read the books, listen to the podcasts, read the magazines and the journals and say, I wish I could do something. I have no skills other than just being a manager of people because I worked in, in retail for years and I don't really, I, I surround myself with wonderful people, amazing people, doers. Most of them are doers. Some of them aren't. People who show up. And that is really what it is. I 100% believe that there are people who possibly watching this right now are saying, I wish I could do more. I don't have the skills. I don't know what to do. Um, I, I would like to, or I don't have the time. I get that a lot. Um, there's ways of doing either eventually finding the time or actually taking a small amount of your time and doing something with it. I can show you how, but a lot of people just, they're armchair skeptics. They, they rather rant on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And I, I can't, I do not have patience for that. I do not have patience for people who do that. My personal story is I was a slacktivist uh, couch potato skeptic until I heard you join the, the grill skeptics. And then I think the other thing was going to my first skeptical conference got me, oh my God, these people are all doing such important things. Why am I not doing this kind of stuff? Even though I was already doing Wikipedia. So, you know, I found a way to get involved even more than I was before. And now I write for Skeptical Inquirer and, and you know, publish in other skeptical places. Um, you've introduced other people to the skeptical movement. Uh, Adrian Hill is, you know, now part of the Skeptic Zone podcast. Another cat. Right? Another cat. <laughs> Another cat. She came to the same PsyCon, I think it was the first one I ever came to, and I met her there. And, you know, she wasn't involved before. And now she's freaking one of the podcast contributors and one of the biggest podcasts there is in the skeptical. She does amazing things. Yeah. So, uh, the ESP, talk about that, right? The the, uh, the, the podcast. Another was, group of cats. The European that I met at a conference. Podcast. KBD introduced them to each other. They said, oh, wow. <laughs> maybe we should eventually they said let's start a podcast and they have a popular podcast called the esp yeah the, the european skeptic podcast because they're getting information about the skeptic community in europe which is totally you know uh, as americans we don't even know who they are but we should i mean come on there's there's no border to pseudoscience just because you know if so so you it's see, all gotta be done you see people this is another reason to come to psychon well, okay. So going back to what you just said really quickly, you got to show up if it, and that's where I tell people, they say, what am I supposed to do? It's like, show up, come to a conference, come to a talk, come to a trivia game, something, just show up, just put your, even if you're not, even if you don't know what you think you could possibly do, put your hand up, even if it's just barely, you're starting to put your hand up just slowly. Like, I think I might want to, and if you're having problems, talk to me, I will, I will help you. I'll talk to you. I'll say, well, what is it you really want to do? How much time do you have? What interests you? What are your skills? Oh my gosh, there's so much that needs to be done within our community that could be just like a one-time thing, like a um, make a logo for somebody or write a little piece of music for somebody that they could use on their podcast. Oh, I just thought of another person, Kelly, Kelly Burke, right? She's there's, become the media coordinator for the Skeptics Guide to the Universe. One of my cats. So you 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 find people to do these things and, and today it might not be obvious what it is that they can do. But eventually, just by meeting other people and socializing, you figure it out after a while. But it takes time. But that's the full mission of the About Time Project, which is abouttimeproject.org. And we are a 50C3 um, um, organization, so you can donate if you really, really don't want to spend the time. 
editing for me, you can donate. Um, that makes it easier for us to travel and to, and to give scholarships and stuff. And you're sending people to conferences this year. What's yes, we have six $500 scholarships for GSO, trained GSOW editors. We are, um, we are a very small group of people who are, are able to take advantage of our, our, our scholarship. We've been wanting to do this for a very long time. This is the first year we're doing it. And I've, had, I've just sent $500 to Pavel in the Czech Republic, who's going to be attending the European Skeptic Congress in Austria. Right. And that $500 made a big difference in his uh, travel plans because he really wanted to go. And now he can, he can actually, um, it's not such a horrible, you know, cost thing. So um, I have other scholarships available for people to go to SciCon, to go to the Australian conference, to the New Zealand conference and to QED. And I want to spend our money getting people to to go if they can last question what are you most looking forward to about this year's conference giving hugs to people oh my gosh I, you know and even people i haven't met yet i i have a feeling that i'm just going to run up to people and start licking their face <laughs> uh-oh uh we're trying to get people to come to uh, cooties 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 well i mean seriously i have i have been traveling i've done talks already i have done stuff i've been the last couple of months i have been out doing talks so i haven't been licking people's faces but i have been giving a lot of hugs and it is so amazing to sit down with people and just sit down and say what have you been up to and you know what can i do to help you and let's and can i have that last piece of pizza you're not eating and, <laughs> and, and, and can i have can i have some ranch for the french fries i have here um yeah, I think that's going to be the thing I'm looking forward to because it's one thing to be seeing the podcasts and listening to podcasts and seeing the videos online, which a lot of communities have done a fantastic job doing. But being there in person, I want to do the Bohemian Rhapsody with all of my favorite friends that I pull on stage. Just anybody who wants to be on stage at the Halloween party, we always do Bohemian Rhapsody in interpretive dance. And we make this up as we go along. So there's no, there's no formal classes or anything. And, and this videos. time it will be in Hawaiian garb because that's the theme, right? Yeah, it's Hawaiian garb, but we can do Bohemian Rhapsody in that. There's videos. There are videos on my YouTube channel, Susan Gerbeck YouTube channel, if you want to see me ridiculously acting out Bohemian Rhapsody. And um, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to sitting at my table, the GSOW table that's always right out in front of the the talks and sitting there and having people come over and talk to me. On that note, I think we'll end it. I want to thank you for your time today. And it was great to be able to record this talk to share with my Skeptical Inquirer column readers and anyone else who stumbles across it on YouTube in the future. Hi, everybody else who stumbles across it. <laughs>